Good afternoon, everyone. And as, as Mark said, good morning or good evening, depends where you are. Um, I'm Gary Momba. I'm the director of the Maritime Archaeology Trust, I'm trying to get my computer to work. Um, and today I'm going to talk about submerged landscapes. I'm going to put it in the context of sea level rise, climate change, I say the separation from mainland Europe, and also look at it as indicators as well, of, as well as cultural indicators, indicators of change in the past that could maybe help us understand future changes. So I'll start with the long term context. Um, going back in time, looking at sort of sea level fluctuations, we had an interglacial following the last interglacial 120 or thousand years ago, had an ice age, sea levels dropped, they dropped down to about 130, 140 meters. Um, and it's very cold and there was no one here in the UK. Then the sea level started to rise. Well, in fact, it warmed up first. So it warmed up. And as it warmed up, animals came back, megafauna, and people followed them. So they came to this big land, this uh, open plains and the coastal plain. And they worked their way north uh, and from Spain and from the east over in the, um, the plains of uh, Europe. And they ended up on the UK. And as they did so, they came, they sort of settled, got a bit wet, and then ultimately they were separated from mainland Europe totally about 8,000 years ago. So that was the people arising, uh, arriving on the site. But something else I should mention with this is really the nature of sea level rise. What tends to happen, you have these sort of waterways, you have lakes, and the people tend to accumulate around them. And as the sea level comes up, past these rivers where people would have been living, the sea level comes up, hits the rivers, it tends to form estuaries and deltas. It doesn't just wash everything away. Now, the hills, it'll wash away, it'll, it'll, it'll level the landscape or the seascape, but it'll leave underneath all these um, uh, all these sort of infilled valleys. And one area where there's nice sheltered infilled valleys, the one that just appeared in front of you on the screen just here, is the Western Solent. It was a valley once, and then in the last few thousand years, a waterway now has come through and is starting to erode, erode it away. Now, this area of the Solent is the south coast of England, We've got the UK map on the bottom right hand corner. Oh, what's happened here? South coast of England. Um, and there's areas in the western Solent that were once infilled with sediment uh, and that we're going to look at now that are being eroded. The main one I'm going to look at is Boldner Cliff, which dates back 8,000 years. And I'm going to then make reference to Thorns Bay on the northwest Solent and also over to the west, uh, the Cadman Causeway at Calshot. Um, so looking at that sediment, you can see in the western Solent now, there's still a lot of, sed lot of sediment lying near the surface. These sort of um, sediments that were deposited as sea level rise would have been layered across the hold of the sediment until the sea level came up. And we know that because we can see it underwater. So this is northwest Solent going to the other side, to the uh, south side of the Solent, uh, and underwater you can see this big lump of sediment. Now let me take you through it a bit. What we have here is a coloured contoured map of the seabed uh, at the top where it's sort of light coloured, whitey sort of pink, that's about four metres below water. You drop down through the red and then to the yellow. At the bottom of the yellow we've got 11 metres underwater and then there's the sort of mockly green now, the motley green stretch, which stretches off into the distance there, that's actually the old land surface that was covered by the sediments as the sea level came in. And above it, you've got seven metres of that sediment, just like I showed you from the surface in the last slide, you've got this thick sediment deposit that was sitting on top of that land surface. Now, you can also see from here that there's a long cliff, almost vertical in some places, in fact, it's vertical with overhangs, in some places on the left, while to the right, you've got this sort of deep, deeper blue colour, which is the centre of the channel that's been now eroded away. So what's happening is a new channel's formed and it's cut right through, like cutting through uh, the sponge cake. And on one side, you've got the remains of it, this vertical cliff section, effectively, of through the land surface. And on the right, you've got it all gone. But that means when we look at that nice sort of platform, you can see that green bench with all the motley green areas, that's the remains of the land surface. And what we're finding on there are all sorts of remains of a submerged forest. And you can see, if you look underwater at these sites, a nice uh, uh, nice trees, the macrophosphate, you've got big uh, trees lying, bowls lying flat, and you've got root systems coming out as well. Uh, but you can also see it's quite murky and dark there. So this is a site 
we've been working on for 20 years and it's been hard really to get this information out to the public because it's hard to show them what's down there when it's so murky and dark with one image at a time. So we've been working on photogrammetry, which I'm sure you're all familiar with now. And we've been taking hundreds of photographs of small areas. This area here is about 14 meters wide uh, of the seabed. An area on that cliff that I showed you just now, Boulder Cliff, the submerged Boulder Cliff. Um, and we've taken photogrammetry photographs and stitched them all together to form 3D models. You can see here these protruding elements. They're the remains of trees and branches that tend to be more robust and they tend to protect the land surface. While behind it, you've got this erosion and that's eroding through to these small cliffs behind. Or to the right, of course, it's lost and eroded away. But as we just turn the circle here and go on top of this platform, you can start seeing this platform, which is made up of peat and trees. It's peat sitting on top of trees. So what you do is you have the trees slowly emerging from it. And it's just below the peat on the lower levels by the cliff that's eroding away, uh, the, the cliff that's eroding away, um, just about 30, 40, 50 centimeters below that peat. And then you can see elements of trees in it that we're actually starting to find um, more, e more evidence of archaeological material. Uh, but just to demonstrate the, I suppose, the value of sites like this, um, it's looking at the ecofacts and the preservation of organic material. These leaves are 8,000 years old. They were brought up from the seabed a few years ago. They've been down that 8,000 years. Looks like they were found in a forest only a few months before. But it's a wonderful level of preservation. And, and but the icing on the cake for us, of course, was the discovery of archaeological material. And it was first discovered, or we first discovered it back in 1999. I say we discovered it, actually, it was a, a lobster. And you can see this lobster here sitting under a big oak tree. Above it, there's an oak tree just fallen on, on its side with bark on it. And below it, in front of it, you can see flints that have been kicked out of its burrow. So this lobster actually went down, did the burrowing, and did the excavation for us. Now, it was quite, quite exciting at the time, and we got back on the boat, which happened to be a fishing boat. And we said, look what we've just found, great big lobster excavating these uh, flints. And the fisherman's ears pricked up, said, ah. We went back a month later, and of course, the lobster was gone, and the fisherman had a big smile on his face. But because the lobster had gone, it meant we could go into the back of his burrow and excavate. And this then became the first site of its kind in the UK, Mesolithic site of its kind, that we discovered underwater. Like I say, we dated all these sites and they date to about 8,000, 7,990 to sort of 8,300 years old. Now, when you go down there today, as we've been going down annually, we just find flints being forced out of the cliff again and again and again. Uh, and the worked flints, um, and of course, I see here lots of cores and plenty of blades and bladelets on the right. You can see the cores on the left. We found over a thousand of these flints, but these tend to just be eroding out of the cliff. The trouble with these sites underwater is they're very difficult to manage and excavate and very expensive, and they're beyond the jurisdiction of any statutory authority. So they tend to be, well, overlooked. And so it's our job to try and bring it to people's attention. And well, that what it's meant is we've really been doing a recovery and rescue exercise over the last 20 years, rather than much detailed excavation. Um, some of the things we found, I say, uh, many flints and including adzes. We found several, and this is one example here. And the adzes are nice mesolithic tools which are used to sort of scallop wood. And so you're cleaning and scraping wood so you can make sort of banks or, 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 or straighten out timbers rather than an axe which is just chopping down trees. This is trying to treat the wood once it's down on its side. So we found a number of these, which is quite significant because the little area we did excavate was one we discovered in 2007. And this was where there was an awful lot of timber, a lot of it being worked. And on the right, you can see some of the uh, elements that we've discovered. Now, the problem with this material is that it's fairly unique in the archeological record. So there's nothing really to compare it with. There's about 120, 130 pieces of worked Mesolithic timber in the UK. And the thing about being worked timber is, it, you know, it needs to have really strong definitive marks to warrant um, the term worked because many bits are very ambiguous. And this is 8,000 years ago and people used all sorts. Um, and this site is, shows you an assemblage of some clearly worked pieces. On the left, you can see a nice sharp piece at the top here that's worked. And just below that, you've got a scalloped out piece, which we believe to be the end of a log boat. 
And in amongst that, in the plan, you can see a scattering of timbers. Some of them look, look worked and some of them are a bit ambiguous. One of the most significant pieces was the bit in the middle of the right, in the middle of the plan that we have, which is actually on the right hand side, the long straight piece. And that uh, on the close examination proved to be tangentially split timber, which means it's split like a plank uh, from a tree trunk. Uh, a tree trunk may be two meters wide and could be 10 or 20 meters long. Now that could either be creating a massive blank, and of course this is the Mesolithic when people were just hunter-gatherers, they didn't stay put, or it could actually be uh, the bottom of a log boat where the other elements with the sides have all eroded away. And the evidence that we found suggests that that's the case. But um, something that's sort of supportive of that evidence is really the interpretation of all these strange little pieces of uh, timber that were called them ambiguous, that not clearly worked. Um, here we have at the top of the screen, we have a piece of timber, we don't know what it is, but you can see a very clear cut mark in it. So that's a nice worked piece, that's quite obvious. The pieces at the bottom, I'm afraid it's not as clear as I'd like, but on one on the left side we have the rounded, all these pieces are turned around on one side, and when you turn them over on the right, they're not, they're flattened. And we've been finding these pieces all over the place uh, back since 2005, 2006 and we couldn't really understand what they were. We couldn't say they were worked because again, they looked ambiguous. They didn't have any definitive markings on them. And so we decided, so well, we had this idea that it could be a log boat. We weren't quite sure. We had all these strange bits of timber like deportage. So we thought we'd conduct some um, experimental archeology. span Just before we go there, I thought I'd just show you this um, example. I've mentioned these, uh, how they've been lying on the seabed. This is an example of what we thought might be a platform where you have a lot of the flat sides upwards. You can see here that's a flat piece of wood. That's the same sort of timber, flat on that side, and then it's rounded on the other. And so we found quite a few pieces of timber like this, and we wondered how they linked to the archaeological site, how it might have linked to the log boat. So the experimental archaeology, we took a small piece of oak tree trunk um, and did a bunch of tests trying to strip the bark. On the bottom, you can see a makeup. Um, an ads being used to sort of strip the bark, which did that quite successfully. Uh, we found a lot of carbonized material on the site, which is a method of actually hollowing out timber by burning it, carbonizing, so you can clear it away. And you can see that on the uh, the bottom image on the right hand side there that we attempted to excavate this mini log boat with bark, uh, with uh, burning it. It took a bit of time, but what we did find is that you can use an ads on that very successfully. While if you try and use an ad adds straight on the center of the oak, it's very difficult. And then in the top picture, you can see us splitting various bits of timber, um, different methods, we're using experimental methods, using antlers and adzes to see how those timbers might come away. And what we found was actually a lot of the timbers came out with bark on one side that was round and flat on the other. And as, it, as was the case with a lot of these bits of timber we looked at, they all proved to be bark. Now, and amongst all that, of course, we found stream, I say of course, um, but it just happens that other, due to the excellent preservation of the uh, environment, we found string, the oldest piece of string in the UK, prepared string, this piece here about 10 centimetres long, uh, and we found a few other little traces of it as well. Um, this is indicating a high level of, of technology. So whatever the case with this, whether the wood was tangentially split or not, or whether it was hollowing out a log boat, it's pretty much at a higher level of technology than anything we're finding on land. And interestingly, this morning I saw, um, uh, on, on, heard on Radio 4, they have a sort of podcast for st uh, school kids. It's sort of a uh, hist historical stories, I think it's called, at 9.45. And they were up at Scarabray and they were sort of looking at the, the remains of the stones and saying, well, if only the timber had survived, but of course it's all lost. And we look underwater here a few thousand years earlier and we're finding timber, and we're finding string and pollen, et cetera, all sorts of material. So we looked at the log boat. We discovered that all these little bits of um, timber were being coming stripped from it, which were bark. So potentially they could actually be laid down on the ground, strip the sides of it and using those timbers to lay flat on the seabed uh, to help to make up the archeological site, to, to form features within the archeological site. Um, now this is the an image of the edge of the platform that I just showed you, you can see uh, sort of uh, going to the top, it's going to the south where you can see uh, planks and things eroding out of the peat 
and to the bottom we have the eroded areas. And this is just to give you an idea of some of the material we found there. The, the centered middle one on the right is that platform I just showed you earlier, um, but we also found posts, not post holes, but we've also found posts scattered around the place, about five in all. But all this is eroding away quite quickly. Now that little area I showed you is on this uh, plan to the top. Now, this is a, a plan of the site looking from above again to the north. You've got the, gr the grey is the sort of darker grey is where everything's eroded away, and the white is that peat platform. And what we found is a whole bunch of wooden features called WF. Um, we go from WF1 to WF05. WF02 was the excavation of the uh, um, potential log boat. WFO3 was the area I just showed you in the last slide uh, where we have all that sort of timber little platform coming out. And WFO4 and WFO5 on the right is the area I'm just going to go to now. This was discovered last summer. And if you look at the bottom image, we're looking now to the south obliquely over the site. Again, you're familiar with that peak platform behind. There's a big tree stump in the middle, uh, the boat building site to the right and to the left, about 20 metres away. Um, you've got WFO4 and WFO5. And here we found a couple more of these peak platforms. I'll show you a quick bit of video. I mean, this is the sort of image that we're faced with when we're down there that we have to interpret. And we found many, many pieces of these sort of parallelly organised bits of wood, but they've been a bit ambiguous. And it's hard really to um, be sure whether they were worked or not. And this is just such an example. Um, and then in amongst it, though, you do tend to find work pieces. I won't dwell on it too much, but what I'll do is I'll I'll just take us forward if I can accelerate the dive a bit. So this is one area where we found some uh, an interesting platform, uh, WFO5, and then WFO4, just a few meters away, we found something a bit more significant. There was more organization in the timber. We found round wood underneath, and then on top, we found many of these sort of rounded and flat pieces there were stripped bark and stripped sapwood laid out in an organized fashion uh, in an area that was two meters long by uh, just under one meter wide. And so this is what we're faced with underwater, but after careful recording and excavation and bring it to the surface, we started to reconstruct what we discovered. And you can see there's a sense of order there even though the wood itself, if you found them individually, it would be hard to say they actually worked. We're finding out that these ambiguous pieces actually were making up structures. And that was the bottom layer. And if you put the next layer on top or the next few layers on top, you can see it's quite a cohesive structure, well organized, and it's full of these nice bits of timber, uh, let's say sheared on one side um, and, after on, uh, uh, and curved on the other. And an interesting one to the bottom, if I can do it without making the screen move, here, I'll come back to in a second, um, was lots of evidence of really clear woodworking, although we don't know what that piece is for. Now, what we've done with this timber is we've um, scanned it, it's got a nice 3D model, so it's accessible to everyone online. But I thought I'd just show you this piece of timber. So in amongst these ambiguous looking pieces of timber that actually make up a structure, you have these funny pieces, which are not quite sure what they're for, but the markings are so clear and so sharp, where they've been sort of split apart with the various adzes. So, um, say so the structure itself, if people want to go and have a look at it, you can find it on Sketchfab, that's Sketchfab under Maritime Archaeology Trust and Models. You can soon find it on your, on your Google or, or these newfangled server things. And also, uh, it, there'll be elements of the Bold and the Cliff uh, site on a new display, as it happens, when we open our museum at the Shipwreck Museum on the Isle of Wight. Although we're not sure that it'll be open until uh, late in July at the moment. But keep your eyes peeled if you're interested in that. And the final thing I should mention about Boulder Cliff is where we had sedimentary DNA uh, from the site. And the material we found, sort of, you know, we, we found evidence of uh, uh, sedimentary DNA of the various pollen, the trees, the animals that, that we'd expect. And we found in the other paleoenvironmental analysis we've done, but significantly, significantly, we found wheat. And the wheat, of course, very special because. It's, this would be 2,000 years ahead of uh, a wheat that came to the UK, just as the tangentially, tangentially split timber skills expertise is 2,000 years ahead of its time. So it looks like we did have wheat. We also found canis, we found 
um, bovine. Uh, so we found evidence of auric, big cows. And in this image here, you can see the auric in the background, um, evidence of um, dog or wolf, but it would be dog because it was in an archaeological site, invariably wolf-like dogs. Um, and so the boat building, a lot of evidence for this as well, which obviously I haven't had a chance to present today. Um, but what we this tells us is the wheat wasn't actually grown on the site, but the wheat would have been transported. It was a very con uh, concentrated lump, would have been transported probably um, from the plains of Northern Europe. Uh, now, this was a period when just before the severance of Europe, everything was getting wetter and people would have been turning to boats more and more to get around before the final severance. So it looks like we have evidence here of deep links within Central Europe into Great Britain at the time, just before the final severance, and high levels of sophistication than we then find following the severance, or say different levels. I think one thing that's also quite significant about this location um, is this woman on the left here. That I think she's making bread and she's using beef in the auric. So we've also probably got the first ever beef burger making site in the world as well. That's yet to be proven. So going across the water to the northern Solent, we got the remains of other forests, and these are exposed right at low water spring tides. Uh, this, this is a, a beach on the Beaulieu Estate where we find trees sticking out of the, the mud. We've also found archaeology. Now the trees have been dated 5,200 years ago, so the Neolithic. This particular structure we haven't yet dated, uh, but it's coming out of the sediments next to it. But of course, this is only exposed uh, when the sea level is much lower, so unless it's associated with fishing, it would be on the mainland. We've worked on the site, we've done sort of 3D models, um, um, created a digital terrain model of the site so that we can interpret it. Uh, the dark green here you can see is like a big sand gravel banks areas around here, and then to the right you've got that exposed peat deposit with the trees, and we've also got a bunch of them just over here. We cored across the site, we found that there's the underlying geology to the right, uh, to the left here, and to the right, east and west, and then peak deposits in between, and or right in the centre of all of it is the remains of an paleo channel. So this is a nice example of a channel running through, sea levels risen, and it's the sediments being laid down and covered and protected the uh, archaeology in the landscape with it. Now the archaeology itself is important because it can tell us about how people adapted to the landscape. This post was dated again 5,000. Uh, 150 years old, calibrated, and what you can see is that the post pushed into the seabed and it's covered in a strange material um, that's like a hardened resin. So it looks like uh, these Neolithic people were sitting there to try and protect, uh, uh, that maybe it was getting a bit wet and they're protecting the timber. A lot of this is new research, so we're still sort of uncovering what we can. Uh, just along the coast at Candon Causeway, um, we've got another uh, area of exposure following a lot of erosion on the foreshore. And one thing about these sites, of course, is once we date them, we know they were covered in sediment for many thousands of years. And once we date them, it can give us a terminus post quem to when those mud flats were first laid on top of them and now they've been uncovered. And so what we have here is an old causeway, um, which what it was, and that we dated um, an element of it to Roman. And you can see a post here. Uh, underwater, as we had to work underwater because this is right on low water spring tides and it's more effective underwater. Um, the post on the right here was dated to about 100 AD, and then the small post sticking out the bottom here we discovered was Bronze Age, and that came in at about 2950 uh, BC. And what's more, we worked away just a bit seaward and we found another big structure you see in the foreground here. These big bits of timber also dated to the Bronze Age. And these, these dated even older. I mean, they're bigger bits of timber, so it could be contemporary. But it's about 6,150, so 3,150 uh, years ago. So not yeah, BC, 3,150 years ago, um, before present. And we excavated these sites, and you can see the remains of some of the material on the top left. You have uh, one of those Roman posts from the first century. Preservation is immaculate. You can see the tool marks clearly embedded in that post. And then to the right at the top, we have Bronze Age um, material. And this Bronze Age posts, again, you can see the tool marks uh, just through the embedded with the peat coming out of them. And at the bottom, which is not very clear, but you can see very de delicate wattling that's coming out the site. So it's probably associated with fishing of some form. 
uh, at the bottom of the tunnel at uh, the, the sea level, uh, sorry, right at the low water mark. So the site itself, we have a one one age, one oops, one area we got this sort of keep moving my thing. Um, we got this sort of bronze age material going back as far as 1700, uh, 1371 BC, whereas the stuff from uh, AD is about 140 AD. So we've got this broad age range where there's been a lot of people using this site over a large period of time. Now that can tell us a lot about the um, I suppose, archaeological activity in the area. It can also help tell us about the change in the landscape. And the change in the landscape being this would have been a much more sheltered area at the time. It would have been inundated when sea level rose, but it must have been behind some of those mud flats I talked about right at the beginning. Mud flats that now have gone and eroded away. And when you look at the site in the Western Solent today, you can see, unlike the mud flats I showed you at the beginning, you can see nothing but a stripped beach. And it's within the stripped beach that we're starting to find a lot of that archaeological material. So the archaeological evidence we have in the paleo environmental evidence can start giving us dates and if we get all the assessments correct we can get um we can use them for index points uh, in the past but we have to get all the, the relevant information uh, and they're tools that can be used to help understand that this past change how quickly the coastline has changed and how quickly it's eroding away today and at that point i better give up because i've just about run over by a couple of minutes so thank you everyone Thank you very much for listening. Oh, I should give a, a big up um, for Eleanor, Dr. Eleanor Schofield, who will be here next week, and she'll be uh, talking about the Mary Rose, uh, she's from the Mary Rose Archaeological Services. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.